My name is Neil Stewart. I'm from LSE in London. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a project uh, we undertook, which is called Charles Booth's uh, London, and I've given it the the uh, just waiting to make sure that the uh, the Wi-Fi is working. I've given it the snazzy subtitle, "Imagining the Victorian Metropolis." So hopefully, I can demonstrate how we did try to imagine the Victorian metropolis. Um, like I say, I'm going to include a. Um, a live demo later, assuming I can get the Wi-Fi to work. If that doesn't happen, then we all get to leave early, so that's good. Um, if you'd like to have a look at the site while I speak, I didn't encourage you to do so. Um, you can search for uh, Charles Booth's London. It should be the top hit on search en on Google. Other search engines are available. Um, or you can go to booth.lse.ac.uk and have a look at the site uh, while I talk. And I should also say I'm going to try and keep to time because I, I am conscious it's the final slot in the graveyard shift and we probably would all like a drink fairly soon. So it looks like we now have Wi-Fi, so on with the show. So um, who here has some knowledge of Charles Booth and Booth's projects and his poverty maps? So that's good. I'm seeing maybe half of the... Um, half of the people in the audience have, have got some uh, knowledge of him. For those of you who don't, so Booth, Charles Booth, was a Victorian businessman, uh, philanthropist and social reformer. I didn't write down when he, when he was alive, but it was between in 1840 and 1916, I want to say. Yeah, roughly, around that. So he, he was quintessential Victorian and latterly Edwardian. Um, now, Booth's project was to try to under, understand the extent of poverty in Victorian London. So, Booth actually, Booth actually went into his, uh, into his project disbelieving that poverty was prevalent, as prevalent as um, many of the thinkers of the day proposed, particularly the Fabian socialists, early socialists. His work, though, his research actually showed that it was actually it was much higher. Some 30% of people in a, a city of um, 6 million lived below the poverty line. And the poverty line was actually a phrase that Booth himself coined as, as to, to express um, the, the point at which someone can be considered to be living in poverty. Um, so that's nearly 2 million people. It was um, what we would now consider to be a mammoth research project involving a, a very large team of people. And the, the project lasted um, 15 years. One of those people was actually Beatrice Webb, um, Beatrice Potter, uh, nay Beatrice Potter, who went on, amongst other things, to form the LSE. So it's another reason why it's an important um, project for us at LSE. And Booth's findings were handed down to us um, by way of ex what we would now consider to be excellent Victorian research data management as a number of things. And I'll just run through what those things were. So there was life and the, the, the publication, Life and Labour of the People in London, which ran to four editions between 1889 and 1903. The final edition in 1903 was um, 17 volumes and over 4,000 pages of findings. There were the poverty maps themselves, and you can see an example of one here, and I'll show you more of that a bit later on. There were 12 individual maps, um, each one representing a particular area of London. There were the notebooks, including the famous police notebooks, um, which were the, the, the writings of the, his research team as, he went, as they went around London, literally walked the streets of London and recorded their findings. And there are around 450 of those, um, so quite a few. And that full archive is held at LSE Library. And as, as you can probably guess, it's considered to be something of uh, a jewel in the crown for not just LSE Library, but for LSE more generally. So what did we have? Well, first of all, we had one, as well as the hard copy archive, we had one very old website, which was called Charles Booth's, on, the Charles Booth Online Archive. And you can see here, we were very pleased and honored to win the multimedia and web category SILIP Emerald Public Re Relations and Publicity Awards 2002 
So this website was from 2000, 2001, which in terms of the web is, is positively archaic. So that, that website did a pretty good job of displaying the archival materials. The maps it didn't really do them justice at all. And um, to use a bit of a euphemism, it had become challenging to manage. Another way of putting that is that we couldn't really do anything with it at all because um, the, the institutional memory about how to, to update this particular site had been lost. So it, it was in some senses a dead website. Although it's worth mentioning that it did continue to get a lot of traffic, so three or 400 uh, user sessions per day. So there, there was obviously demand for um, information about Booth and uh, the Booth maps and so on. We also had uh, an old-ish website, um, which was called Phone Booth. A colleague, Peter Spring, I always mention Peter because he had the genius idea of naming it Phone Booth because it's Booth and you look at it on your phone. <laughs> Although, interestingly, we do get... We, we got hits to this site from people looking at the his, looking for information about the history of London phone booths. So who knew that people were interested in that? But there we go. Um, so this had modern mapping application functionality. So it had kind of slippy maps. Um, we could ge we geolocated the notebooks against um, areas areas of the map. But the site was experimental and prototypical. It's was essentially in a sort of permanent public beta form. Um, so we, we, we knew we needed to do more with that site as well. So we had these two different websites. So what we did, what we knew we needed to do was to bring together the functionality of the old websites. But also we had an opportunity in that in 2016, it was the 100th anniversary of Booth's death is slightly morbid, but it, it seemed like a good, a good hook to hang our hat on, so to speak. And as a, to com commemorate the, that 100th anniversary, um, there was an exhibition in the library which was curated by my colleague Indy, who's in the audience over there. Um, there was a research festival around the contemporary resonance of Booth's work, so, what's, so all sorts of aspects to that, so information visualisation, um, the way in which we think about um, poverty in the city, social history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's also a Booth family memorial event. So the many, many um, uh, ancestors, not ancestors, what's the opposite of that? Um, many, uh, I can't remember. Many members of Booth's family came to LSE to commemorate his life, um, which was great. So there are about 50 of them. Uh, it was amazing. And we actually one very memorable moment was revealing the new version of the website, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute, and they actually uh, gasped and clapped, so that was quite, quite something. Uh, so to do this work, we, we had a cross-library team. Um, we had a project manager, which, which was me. We had a UX specialist, a web editor, a metadata specialist, and an archivist, Indy, who I've already mentioned, who's in the audience. Um, we, we divided our work between outsourced web design, and that was our web development partners, Mickey and Mallory, who are based just across the river in, in Manchester proper. Um, but we did the conceptualization, the technical development, copywriting, project management, and so on in-house. So that's something that we, we took on ourselves to do. Um, we did user experience and audience analysis, um, followed by the web and technical um, development. So we tried to work out, we tried to understand who our audiences actually were. And there's obviously, a site like this has got obvious academic interests, so uh, those people interested in social history, the history of London. But we also found out by doing this research that there was um, a considerable interest for people who are interested in family history and genealogy. Um, so perhaps your great-great-grandfather or grandmother lived in Victorian London, and you could actually have a look at uh, the archive and the maps to, to perhaps get an understanding of, of what their life might have been like. So the project was started in May 2016, and we actually completed it uh, at the end of November 20, uh, 2016, so almost exactly a year ago. The screenshots here give an idea of the, what, what we tried to do with an iterative design process. So we had, it, it's probably not super clear, but 
that plus that sort of equals that. And we, we sort of, we, we turned that final design, um, Frankenstein's booth website, because it's, we got the kind of paper and scissors and glue out and clutched things together to try and get a design that, that, that we liked. And here is the site. So we're, we're giving, uh, we, we've obviously made an effort to use modern um, web design presets. Um, we've got uh, color scheme, both based on the maps, but also some of the kind of LSE branding. So we've tried to make it look like an LSE website. Um, and we've got this primary architecture at the top here. So you can see maps, notebooks, highlights, uh, learn more and about, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you through some of that as well. So to have a look at the maps, let's grab my notes. We have a single uh, stitched, so the 12 maps are stitched together into one single map, and we've geo-rectified that map, which means that we've, we've aligned it with a, a map of, properly aligned it with a map of modern day London. Um, and if we zoom in a bit, I'll use where LSE is as our point of reference to begin with, which is just here. Um, we've got a legend, which is, to, which is the legend that Booth himself used. And I'm not sure how visible that is, but you can see the famous categorization of poverty. And streets marked as black. Streets marked black such as this one here, Booth classified as lowest class, vicious, semi-criminal, which is a very Victorian way of thinking about poverty, although it's worth noting there that um, Booth, um, uh, the Victorian sense of vicious was vice-prone as opposed to, you know, uh, liable to lash out. We also overlaid um, the notebooks against the map. So, for example, We click here, you can show notebooks, and we get these green dots, which is a bit tricky to decide what color to use for those dots because you don't want anything too garish, but you also don't want anything that, um, that kind of gets, gets lost in the, the colors of the map. So I'm, I'm not sure how well we did that, but there we go. Then if you click on one of those, those um, dots, you get to view the notebook entries themselves, and we can, we can go through to that. And this uses the triple IF viewer, which has a uh, universal viewer, which has been mentioned a few times already today, which is a, a standard, triple uh, IF is a standard method of displaying images on the web, archival material on the web. And if we go in, and it get, allows you to do all this great full text, uh, sorry, full screen, and we can zoom here as well, I think just by clicking, yeah. And you can see, you might be able to read that at the top there, we've got, walk with police constable E. Tate round district bounded to the north by New Oxford Street and High Hoban on the east by the city boundary, which ran, runs through Staple Inn and continues. And George Duckworth, who's the researcher in question, has even drawn a little map to orient, orientate himself. So that for those of you who know London, um, Lincoln's Inn Fields is here. So the modern day L LSE is, is sort of here. Um, so it gives you a real sense of the you know, the Victorian city, hopefully. And it's also possible to access, if we go into the notebooks area proper, it's also possible to access the map via notebooks. So if we run a quick search, and look down a bit. So here's, here's an example of something that's come up with High Hoban. This is actually a really, really nice page because this is, again, it's George Duckworth, and this is, he's saying he's at the special licensing session of the Hoban uh, something, uh, Justices of the Peace at the Hoban Inn Hall. And he, again, once again, he's drawn a, a little diagram of the, of the layout of this uh, session of the Justices of the, of the Peace. So again, hopefully very evocative of, of, you know, of, of late 19th century London. So if I go out of there, and you can, you can see where this is, where this is geolocated. So it's um, apparently this meeting happens uh, 
just south of uh, Oxford Street. So we, we did think quite a lot about those, those sort of in interactions. Um, let's get my notes together. And some of that was quite tricky, just like me looking through my notes, which I shouldn't have allowed to get out of order. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that interaction design, um, we, we had, uh, you probably, you might have noticed what, just when I was demoing uh, this, we had some examples of non-digitized notebooks that were being geolocated against the map because we hadn't yet digitized the full archive. So we needed a way of telling people, that, sorry, you can't see this, um, you, you can't see this. We did think about flashy kind of pop-ups and all that sort of thing. In the end, we've just linked through to something saying, I'm sorry, we haven't digitized all of the notebooks, but hopefully we'll get around to that soon. Another challenge for us was, was thinking about the way in which um, we deal with discrepancies between um, modern day and Victorian London. So to give you an example of that, it might be a bit tricky to see, but... Just here, there's a street called Veer Street. So you'd think, in theory, you'd be able to search for Veer Street. And you think to yourself, oh, great, there's Veer Street. I'll go to that and find it on the map. It's actually taking you elsewhere, though. So it's taking you to Veer Street just off Oxford Street. Now, I forgot to mention the opacity slider. So we're now transforming the map into modern-day London. The reason that we, we were able to look, we were able to locate uh, Victorian Veer Street is because there's a modern day version of Veer Street which continues to exist. And the search is done on modern day, the modern day map of London as opposed to the Victorian, uh, the poverty map. So we're giving, you know, we could be giving false positives there. And as part of the research we did into this problem, um, so that Veer Street, and you, you can see, if I zoom in a, a little bit, the Veer Street, which is here, is, um, whoops, it's no longer with us, so it's gone, that, and you can see there, it's been overlain by Kingsway and the Aldwych, that was actually a slum clearance, which happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so, and the analysis that we did showed that some 50% of the streets of London had, had changed since Booth's time as a result of redevelopment. There's the Blitz, of course, which we've, we, we heard about a little bit in a previous session, I think. Um, so how do we deal with this? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we might deal with that at the end of the presentation. So to go back into PowerPoints... So hopefully that gives you a sense of the site itself and some of the challenges we were we were we were thinking about. And just some brief notes on technology there. So we used OpenStreetMap and the OS names IP, uh, API to allow that searching that I showed you to, to take place. IIIF and Universal Viewer I've already talked about. We used Elasticsearch to index the metadata of the notebooks. If you're interested in this technical stuff, there's, there's a, there's a full write-up by our developer, Tom Carter, which you can see at that URL. I'll, I'll tweet that out after the session because it's a horrible, horrible URL. So what does the future hold? So I've mentioned this issue with, with mapping and the fact that um, you can very easily, obviously, search the, the modern-day map of London, but it's, it can be difficult, it can be challenging to search the Victorian map. So we're thinking about how we, how we address that. One way of doing that would be to create a gazetteer of Victorian London, which would be to record every street in the Victorian city and on the Victorian poverty maps, and then give those uh, uh, vector um, coordinates to, to say where they are. The, tr the problem with doing that is that if, if we, if one of us or a group of us in, in LSE Library, or if we outsource that or whatever, 
we estimate that it would take over a thousand hours to do. So a, a great deal of very painstaking and quite frankly, quite tedious work for, for a single person to do. Um, there would be other benefits to that though. We could release that information as an open data set. So if other people wanted to recreate a, a map of Victorian London, they would be free to do, do so using that information. We could do nifty things, presumably, if we also got uh, classifications of the level of poverty for each of those streets. So you could have functionality on the website so you could select only vicious, only streets that are deemed to be vicious and have those highlighted on the map. So there's, there's a great deal of uh, potential for this. We thought about options um, with crowdsourcing, perhaps. Um, crowdsourcing, it would take a, it'd probably take a day or two to, to glean this information from uh, citizen scientists. And one avenue of possibility we're exploring is with the Institute of Historical Research's uh, Layers of London projects. And Layers of London, I'd encourage you to have a look at that if, if you're not familiar with it, because they're doing some so th things that are quite similar to what we've done with Charles B's London, except they're using multiple different maps, multiple different historical maps of London, and then overlaying those on modern day uh, maps of, of the capital. I put there digitize, digitization of the rest of the archives, so um, we've actually done that. So we've now got digitized versions of all of the notebooks, give or take a few, which were very challenging to digitize. Um, so at some point, we'll need to add those to the, to the site. So we've got essentially the full Booth archive available via Charles Booth's London. One thing I didn't mention um, in my demo was highlights articles and I'm not going to do that now, but highlights articles are a, a way, uh, we've tried to give a way into the um, archive by providing um, kind of narratives about particular thematic um, interests of the archive. So we had one on drink and drugs, one on uh, migration and immigration, and one on um, prostitu prostitution. That was the third one, wasn't it? So slightly salacious, but we thought they'd be a way of giving people an in to what uh, the, the maps we thought sort of speak for themselves, but the, the archive can be a, a, an intimidating thing to try and dive into. So we wanted to, to give people a way in, an easy way in. And we'd like to do more of that because we think they've been successful. So we, we'd like to look at that again. And I've, I've talked very briefly about user experience testing. We did try and do UX work um, when we were doing the, in the fairly limited time we had with the project. We're yet to take it out to, the, to our public and see what they think and then act upon what they think about the site. So things, there's obviously things that we could be doing better, but we need help in doing that and we need to, we need to talk to our users to, to understand that better. Thank you very much. There's that URL again. Um, there's actually an LSE, there's um, a, a blog that LSE runs called Impact of Social Science. So um, myself and my colleague Andy have written a post for that, which will be coming out later in the week. I couldn't persuade them to make it live <laughs> for this talk, unfortunately, but there we go. So if, if, you wanna, if you wanna know more or wanna read about this, that's a good place to go, as well as Tom Carter's um, technical writer. I think that's everything I had to say. Thank you very much.